Welcome to the Nature Journal Connection. I'm your host, John Muir Laws, and today what we're going to be doing is a deep dive into some of the questions which we've already asked in our Nature Journals on previous adventures and investigations. We're going to be doing some research to see if we can get some answers and probably some additional questions on top of the ones which we already asked. I love playing around in the field, and as I do, I'm constantly asking questions. Some of my questions, I can use my direct observations or the process of inference to answer my own questions in the field. But some of my questions will also remain as things that I might have to look up later. So part of my process is also sometimes to look through my journals and find a few kind of high percentage questions that would be really interesting to do a deeper dive with. You can't do this with every question. So don't feel pressure that if you ask a question, you're gonna to have to um, answer um, or try to uh, do research on every one that you, that you find. We're gonna be asking many, many, many more questions than we could possibly answer. But every once in a while, it's fun to take some of the, the, the high percentage ones and see, let's dig a little bit deeper with this and see what happens. So that's what I'm doing today with this set of observations. Some time ago, I was out at a reservoir and I made these observations about two clams. One small one, this little one right here, all right? I've got this little clam, and then I had my big one. And the little one had a very strong shell. The big one had a weak shell. That was curious to me. At that time, I also, um, I also noticed that there are many, many growth rings on the big one, and I counted those up. And I was thinking, if these are annual rings like you get on a tree, then this clam, is more than 100 years old. So I was thinking, that's, I wonder how old clams can get. Um, and uh, so is that what's going on with this? I really want to know. So very often it helps to start a process like this by seeing if we can identify some of the species. Uh, you may have some, some books on hand that can help with this, so I often like to try to surround myself with as many field guides as I can, and I'm constantly looking for interesting ones. Today I've been looking through this one on freshwater invertebrates, and um, in this book I was able to identify or get a tentative identification for this little shell right here. And oh, what it is, is a, a clam from Asia that is now spreading around the entire world. So it's uh, started its distribution in Asia. Now it's throughout Europe, um, South America, uh, North America. Don't know about Africa, but I would suspect that this little clam is having adventures there too. Um, so this, this, this little clam is going everywhere. And that's interesting, you know, really cool adaptation, strong shell. Um, that might be one reason why it's been so successful on its little adventures. Um, but this big one, I wasn't able to identify that clam. So in addition to looking at books on shelves or in the library, we can also use online searches. You can also look for experts. So I called up Dr. Terry Gosliner at the California Academy of Sciences. He's an expert in invertebrate biology. And I said, what, I can't identify this, this big clam. Uh, what clam am I looking at? And um, he took a look at the notes that I'd taken and said, well, Jack, the reason that you, you have not been able to identify this clam is because it's not a clam. It's a muscle. 
It's a freshwater mussel. So I was looking in entirely the wrong parts of the books. So that's kind of fun. So it's a freshwater mussel and it's called the winged floater. So now I had some identification uh, of my critters and I have been having a lot of fun doing research on this. I found an entire book online of freshwater mussels of the Pacific Northwest. And I've been looking at all sorts of other research on freshwater clams, and I've learned a lot. What I'm going to do now is take some of the information that I've learned, and I'm going to add it to this page. I'm going to put it over in a different section, because I want to keep separate. Here's the stuff that I've observed in the field, and here's stuff that I'm doing from research later on. Those are different sorts of ways of knowing, ways of learning from my direct personal observation or from another source. I also, I want to cite the source that I'm getting it from. So anything that I'm writing and I learned this from over here, I'm going to say, I learned this from this website or I learned this from this book. This is a really important thing to do. We want to keep track of not just getting more, more information in our head, but where does that information come from? What is the strength of the evidence for those sorts of claims? When you're looking for things online, that last question is particularly important because online, um, anybody can publish something. And so there's a lot of information out there, but there's also a lot of misinformation. And so when we see a claim online or anywhere, a really useful question that we can say to ourselves, so like, wow, that's really interesting. What is the evidence for that? What is the strength of the evidence for that claim? So let's take a look at what I've learned during my little investigation. These rings, I was wondering if this is a hundred year old um, muscle. Well, it turns out that these floaters, um, they have shorter lifespans than most of the freshwater mussels. And this isn't um, a hundred year old mussel. So these rings are not annual rings, but um, these will live to about 10 or 15 years. So that means every year it's making more than one ring. Something that I always like to do is when I get one question answered, I like to come up with um, another one right behind that. So these are not annual rings. What is it that is um, causing the, the, this muscle to lay down a ring? If it's not some sort of annual seasonal change, what causes, uh, what is the ring an indication of? See what I've done is I've come up with one answer to one of my questions, and then I found the question that is waiting behind that. So just because I've come up with one answer doesn't mean that my investigation and my curiosity closes there. I'm able to follow up that with the next question. It just raises the next question. So what is causing those rings? They're not annual rings. I don't know, but 10 to 15 years. So that's cool. Um, and the names of these um, has a great story behind it. So I found online this book called Freshwater Mussels of the Pacific Northwest. I put a little um, indicator in to uh, note where I got this information from. And they say that these thin shells allow the little floater to float on fine sediment and silt in the bottom of a lake, where heavier shelled things would probably sink. So uh, the floaters will float on top of the silt that allows them to exploit areas in a lake that other mussels um, or clams are not going to really be able to use. In addition to that, when the water gets really low, if the water gets really low in oxygen, sometimes a, a lake um, may get an algae bloom, bloom that will result in the oxygen levels going really, 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 really down, causes a die off in the lake. If these die in the lake, gases will build up inside them. And because the shells are really thin, they will float up to the surface. So the floaters will, when they die, they'll float up to the surface of the lake. So those are two reasons why floater is a good name. Another fun thing that I found out about these is that the larva of the mussels spend part of their early part of their life cycle attached into the gills of fish and the fish will travel around and spread the uh, mussel around to new areas because they go hitchhiking in the gills of fish. Whoa. 
What about the little clam over here? So this is a clam originally from Asia, but now it has spread worldwide. Um, they think a lot of that's been in the, the ballast of ships. So in the water that is stored in the, the, the base of ships, these clams can travel in that. They are fertile when they're born. And so they can, um, when they're born, able to have their own babies. And one clam, clam can release 68,000 larvae per year. So that's one reason why they've just been so successful. So a tough little shell um, can handle lots of different conditions. And then they're born just ready to make more copies of themselves. So then a question I have on top of that, if they are self-fertile, um, essentially cloning themselves, um, what they, do they do to help um, get more genetic variation um, in them to respond to kind of environmental changes. So you see, again, one question gets answered. A question can then lead to the next question can lead to the next question. You'll notice in my notes here um, where I'm talking about the floaters, here I have a little drawing of these two muscles on top of a bed of silt. Here I have a very sad faced muscle, little frowny face on this little cartoon of this frowning muscle. I know that's not how a muscle would frown, but I've drawn a little muscle with a frown on it because it's dead. And that one is floating on the surface of the water. Over here, where I'm making a note about the larvae traveling in the gills of the fish. Here's a little drawing of fish, little drawing to the gills. Well, what I'm doing is I'm using little visual notes to help me remember these details more, uh, more easily. So in your notes, don't just write down a few things that are interesting, but see if you can turn that into a little icon, into a little visual. Just the little drawing of the fish helps you be able to remember that little, that little detail. These are what we call sketch notes. And sketch notes just are little cartoons that will help you remember an idea more vividly. You just write that down, we're going to forget a lot of those details. But the minute you've made a little drawing like that, it's going to stick in your brain much better. Last thing to note, here's this drawing of the book. I got this information from the book. I got this information from Wikipedia and looked at their citations there. So I've got that this I found in Wikipedia, and here's the citation that Wikipedia was citing. I looked at that article as well. So there's also an indication of where this information came from. This is a little infographic about this discovery. This is from research that takes these observations just a little bit further. Your nature journaling challenge this week is to create your own infographic based on the research that you do around your own question. So start by looking through a number of your old nature journals at previous adventures and explorations that you've had. Pay particular attention to the questions that you're asking. And what you're looking for, you're looking for a really rich and interesting question that you authentically want to follow up on. And once you've got this question, a good next strategy is to try to get the species involved identified. So you can look at field guides. You can also talk with, with experts. Uh, you may know somebody who, say, is really good at birds, and they can help you with that bird identification. You can show them your journal, and they'll be able to help you identify the, the critter that you're looking at. And then, once you know the species, you can start to do a more expanded literature search to try to go after the answers to your questions. You can use field guides. You can use other books. You can use online resources, and you can also consult with people who may have a lot of knowledge about these areas. Take all that information, and what you're going to do is translate that onto a page to create an infographic. So an infographic is not just, I'm going to, here's a list of the cool facts that I've learned. 
What you're going to be doing is playfully integrating drawings and cartoons and icons and written notes to, as clearly as possible, explain and highlight the most interesting things that you have learned and the answers to your questions. Through this process, you may be able to answer your question. And sometimes you won't. In either case, it's okay. The most important thing is that we have learned something through this process and been able to take that information and transcribe it into our journal in a way that will be easy for us to remember in the future. That's how we learn. If you answer your question, try to see if there is another question on the other side of it. If the answer to that question that can then prompt you to the next question. So I always like to leave a process like this still curious. And this keeps me engaged in learning as I explore the wonders and beauty of this amazing world. And until next time, this is your Nature Journal Connection. Do, do, do.